Hongkong. Um, we have a very young audience here. Great to have you here, and Dieter. people on stage too. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, let me start with this, uh, Dieter. Yesterday, I touched down at Hong Kong International Airport, and I saw a suitcase, a robot suitcase, following its own around. That got me to thinking, I'm lousy at parking. I'm not very good at, I'm not a very skillful driver. So can I have a car that can allow me to hop off the car anytime I want, and it just go park itself? Is this too wild a dream to dream right now? Well, it's just reality. When you buy a production car from Mercedes, you can have exactly that feature. And uh, at least when you're relatively close to a parking, mm -hmm. um, you just take your, your smartphone and you make a movement like that just to make sure that you are visiting what's happening, watching what's happening. And then the car sees the parking space and parks itself. That's reality by today and not a vision for tomorrow. Yeah, what does a future car looks like? Well, um, certainly it's emission free. Mm -hmm. um, certainly it's autonomous when you want it to be autonomous. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them certainly will use the third dimension as well. So we will have flying cars as well. How is AI changing cars? Well, AI is uh, certainly a very important tool. Um, it, we use it and we need it in almost all we do in life in the future. Yeah. But certainly the autonomous driving could not be realized without uh, AI. Um, it's for uh, identifying the patterns that they understand. This is a pedestrian, that is a bicycle, this is whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it's to fuse the different sensor information together uh, and it's to develop the algorithms, what to do with all this information, where to drive next. Yeah. So all of that is done with AI. Sounds like you're feeding the machines with information for the machines to learn. But let's say this, we expect AI, artificial intelligence, to be human intelligence exhibited by machines. So look at how humans learn from, we learn from our memories, we learn from experience, and we can learn from each other. Can cars do that too? Well, um, and I think machine learning is probably a better um, name than artificial intelligence. It's not artificial, it's human-made, this right. intelligence. Um, but um, the learning is that they collect thousands of data and um, get some kind of feedback to understand what of this reaction to this data is a good one, what is a bad one. And with that, they're learning and understanding patterns and uh, doing what they did before then in a better way every time. And um, that's where we're going. Of course, it very much uh, depends on the circumstances, whether you're in different countries or whatever. Um, but the basics the car then knows based on its experience, which is just a real load of data. What, what are you doing in your labs right now? I mean, we know that the cars have cameras, have radars, have different kind of sensors. What is the latest technologies that you're testing right now? Well, first of all, the, the perfect combination is called sensor fusion of all these sensors, including the information from a high definition map mm -hmm. um, is the first thing which you have to really um, control and be able to execute. Um, and then the next thing is, as I said before, to develop these um, right strategies, how to, what you do as a human, uh, you see there's a car coming from the right, what do you do? You brake, you go to the left or whatever. All these reactions the car has to have in, in their storage to know what they could do. And, uh, but of course, uh, for instance, uh, they learn you don't cross a white line. Um, yeah. uh -huh. But now the car sits in a parked car, he might sit there forever. Yeah. Because the, the creativity of humans, of course, is missing. And how to deal with this kind of situations is something we still are working on. So this is about uh, if you would teach a car to choose behavior over rules at some point, right? Including interaction. I mean, you see when you're looking at the pedestrian at a on, on the sidewalk, uh, whether he intends to cross the street or not. You see that from the face, from the eyes. And these are things where we still are working hard with cars to get into this direction as well. And the car, the, the, the guy on the sideline, typically looks into the face of the driver and has some information what the car will do next. So we try to put signs on the cars that they give signals, I see you, uh, wait a minute, I'm going, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but this is all in development still. How about human-machine interaction? I mean, I cannot 
talk to a car. I possibly can talk to a car, but I cannot have eye contact with my car. So how do I do that? Well, actually, um, we are having cameras in the car, and they see when you're getting tired because they have eye contact with really? you. Really? Yeah, of course. Maybe I'm just having the wrong kind of eye makeup. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are very good in differentiating because they take several, for instance, how you move the steering wheel gives them information uh, how active and how energetic you are at this point of time. And they might, today the cars are adaptive, they might choose, at least a Mercedes can do that, choose uh, uh, more agile music to wake you up because they feel, okay, getting a little bit uh, tired, this young lady on my wheel. Mm, and speaking of AI, should we be afraid of AI in the future? What is it that humans can do that AIs cannot do in terms of cars? Well, I think these are uh, two questions. Uh, the first one, of course, every technology has some risk associated with this as well. I personally would be rather more afraid of uh, human intelligence and the lack of, in some cases, and uh, what humans tend to do sometimes. Um, but, uh, of course, we have to be um, conscious that uh, whatever you develop, people can do wrong things with them as well. So, for yeah. instance, we have to make very sure that uh, cyber security is guaranteed, that not someone outside can hack the car and then decide where the car has to go, the autonomous car. That would not be a nice idea. So these are, for instance, risks. In AI in general, some people are afraid that like iRobot or movies like that mm -hmm. would become reality and they would take over. I think we are pretty far away from that. Another consideration is uh, what impact on the labor market we will have. Mm -hmm. Typically in the past, new technologies, uh, first of all, stopped a lot of existing jobs, but built many more new ones. We still don't know if that will be true for AI as well. They ha don't really have to worry about losing jobs to machines, as long as to learn the new, new skills that's needed for working with machines. When, when we are talking, for instance, about our plans, some people think we are building plans with our people. That's not true. Uh, we are working on cooperation models. Yeah. Um, Machines or robots are just good in repetitive work or in hard work. Yeah. So, on the other hand, uh, humans are and will basically continue forever to be much more creative uh, and more context-driven. So, these two build a perfect couple, and that's how we are working our plans that uh, actually, uh, for instance, you want to put a battery into a car, which is a huge thing, mm -hmm. uh, very heavy, so human hardly can that do that. Machines do that. The robot can do that, but the robot... Uh, just on its own to find the exact right position. It's a very cumbersome process. Mm -hmm. So why not just take the human, the robot on the arm, say, oh, well, put it here, and that's the right position, and then the two together do a perfect job. Would you say that cars can become emotional? Um, I mean, I'm getting very emotional when I'm in the car, <laughs> but that's probably not what you're I asking you for. Um, there, I mean, emotions in the first place are something which is not related to robots. On the other hand, uh, we are working with startups um, where with face recognition they can understand your emotion by the changes in your face and they can show uh, like an avatar, uh, artificial face and this face then can smile and can look sad. Um, so they simulate emo uh, emotions mm -hmm. and thereby getting closer and make the people feel a little bit more comfortable because they're more used to these kind of faces than a robot face. Oh, so my cars can actually be my good friend in future. Someone can actually take my I guess there's no lag, but it would be an additional opportunity. Yeah, so, but how can you make sure that the cars draw the right conclusions from all the information that you feed them? I mean, in countries, you, we see uh, traffic rules, driving habits, road conditions. They differ from country to country, sometimes from city to city. How do you deal with that? I mean, first of all, even in a given space, of course, that is a huge challenge that not only 99% of the cases, they draw the right conclusion, but basically always, because you really want to work towards accident-free driving. Um, but then you're totally right. Uh, on top of that, the challenge is different. In the US, for instance, the signal is behind the crossing. In Europe, it's in front of the crossing. A very significant difference if you stop right in front of the red light right. in the US, not a good idea. <laughs> um, and there are many other issues which are specific or whatever. Uh, if in, in Germany, uh, the, the autonomous car would see something like an elephant. Either it wouldn't know what to do with it, what it is. Would a car recognize an elephant? Um, 
or see it as a big dog. If it's just a German car, it would say, well, my program is broken, I stop. <laughs> Uh, but uh, as we are learning with these cars everywhere, in India it might be something which can happen. Yep. So uh, it has to recognize this as well, and they say, okay, it's just another obstacle, and I have to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And about autonomous driving, I'm very keen on that, because I was hoping one day I can put on makeup in my car while my car drives me to my destination. That would be very practical and useful. So how far are we from the commercialization of autonomous driving cars? I mean, um, You're doing fee feasibility studies right now. We are, uh, of course, on our own um, places, we are already uh, testing a lot of autonomous cars. We just got uh, most recently from a city in California um, who was um, offering to three companies the possibility to participate in a test, in a real-life test there. Uh, we are one of the chosen ones, which is a very big and important step. So uh, with pilots, uh, we are starting, this is next year basically now, um, till this is uh, normal use for every customer in a bigger place, I would say that's like two, max three years out. But it's becoming real now. And what about road testings? Are you doing it in any... Uh... Again, good news. Uh, we are the first uh, company who got a license to road test autonomous cars in Beijing. In Beijing. In, in, Beijing. in Beijing traffic. In You're Beijing traffic, that. one of okay. the easiest challenges. Uh, but that's a good test, therefore. And um, we are very happy because, of course, um, China is the biggest market for us. And uh, in, when we want to go autonomous, uh, we have to make sure that it works in China. And therefore, this testing is extremely precious for us. So you, are you also working with local partners because you have to do research on the local traffic conditions, right? That's absolutely true. Um, and of course, um, use, for instance, local maps or uh, local tech partners for whatever connectivity you need, mm -hmm. uh, especially in, in China where obviously um, I think more than 80% of the people are um, exact, especially um, attached to connectivity, whereas, for instance, in Germany, that's 25%. So it's very important here in China. And therefore, we are very glad as well that we just most recently agreed on a um, co-development, on a joint venture kind of with uh, Tsinghua um, University in Beijing um, to do research uh, under Chinese condi uh, conditions for autonomous driving. Yeah, you talked about how tech-savvy the Chinese customers are. This is actually the case across Asia, largely. Sure. So you're teaching your AIs to learn about different driving habits across the region. So localization must be a very key strategy for you. I mean, it has not always been. Obviously, uh, Daimler is a company whose founders invented the car. Yeah. So for quite some time, we were convinced engineers know it all. Customers are amateurs, so they can be happy if they get a car from us. Um, obviously, this has changed. And for instance, yes, for some time we tried to teach the American customers that they should drink their coffee at home and mm -hmm. not spill it in our cars, but they wanted to cup holders. And we better finally accepted that and built in cup holders. Now, here we just most recently uh, showed a concept car, uh, Vision Maybach, which not only has cup holder, but a whole tea um, preparing a tea device, set. a tea oh. set within the car, so specifically adapted to the Chinese market in this case, um, that is absolutely key. And for instance, uh, our MBUX um, user experience, uh, which is unique uh, with Mercedes, um, speaks three different um, Chinese uh, dialects, and you can interact... Including Cantonese? Uh, Cantonese, of hungry. course, is among, uh, mm -hmm. but please don't ask me about all three of them. Okay. Uh, but you might guess, the, the most uh, used ones. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, and, uh, but you, you're not supposed to say specific uh, word sequences, but you can speak freely and tell them, well, it's warm, and then it takes the temperature down, uh, or what about some good restaurants, and you get the answer. So um, this is extremely handy and especially around the globe, but especially here in Asia, uh, extremely well received by our customers. Yeah, this is like having an assistant who also drives you where absolutely, you want. Absolutely, and even can go beyond uh, your, your normal car driving. You can say, well, I forgot to have a, a gift for my wife tonight. Well, can you make me some proposals? Mm -hmm. And then you go. 
wow, amazing. Yes. Who would need an assistant when they have a very smart Mercedes Benz? Of course not. <laughs> and also, uh, you talked about how you listen to the customers and learn from their driving habits and then to develop and improve your products. So, did you learn also, did you also, I mean, that should be helping you to get a tremendous growth in the Chinese market in the past, especially the past two years, yeah. right? Well, actually, uh, we were um, significantly behind in volume our um, main competitors here in China four or five years ago. And we made quite a number of changes, sales organization. We have a Daimler board member who is located in Beijing. Um, we listened, we tried to understand the customer. Uh, we, we put in their, uh, the, the really important demands of Chinese customers. Very important one, extended wheelbase, lots of space because uh, Chinese people obviously like to take their family, their friends in the car. So when we listened to all of this input and came up with adequate cars which really surprised and exceeded their expectations of our customers, now since two years we are on number one and are really enjoying this tremendous um, success and growth. This is true on a global basis, but it was not true in China till two years ago, and now we are there as well. Yeah, I, I can actually offer you one piece of uh, customer advice. For women, driving to driving heel on heels is not safe. So I need to change at least one of my shoe when I drive. So if you would find a place to put my shoe in the future in the car, that would be great. A shoe that doesn't get in the way when I hit the brakes and the gas. The alternative is that the car brakes and uh, push the throttle on its own. Then you can wear the high heels in the car as long as you want. See, AI okay. solves so. everything. <laughs> Great. And also, let me ask you this. Uh, so, Mercedes-Benz, uh, we all know, is the inventor of cars, and you've been here for 130 years. So where does that leave you today when you have all these heritage and traditional core values you need to follow? And nowadays, the car industry is shifting, is changing so fast that your competitors may not be the traditional OEMs anymore. It could be Google, could be Amazon, you know, companies like that. Where does that leave you? The core is, values do you apply today? That's a very good question because, on the one hand, still our experience of 130 years serves us very well. And we have fantastic engineers and really great technology and always try to build the best cars in the world. On the other hand, in this tech field, um, it's not about looking at the final, final optimization going from 99 to 100%, but it's about speed. And to come up perhaps even with a better version um, faster than your competitors. You can't do that by coming up with a new airbag and sometimes it pops, sometimes it doesn't when you need it. That doesn't work. So obviously, we still have to maintain this uh, extreme enthusiasm for optimizing to the absolute maximum for the perfect car on the one hand. At the same time, the same company, we need a culture which is daring, which goes for big steps and is not afraid of failure, and then just does it better the second time and getting there. And to have both in one company is not an easy deal, but we're seeing tremendous progress. We, we are, uh, we're having great new people coming to our company. We are working in different places in the West Coast and the US, here in the East Coast, in China, and many places where you find this kind of spirit and atmosphere. And we are now really, we call this a two-pillar strategy, a perfect match between all the wealth of experience and their pioneering spirit to go for new uh, new uh, rivers and new yeah. places. Yeah, as you are doing in China right now, because we know the Chinese customers, we basically live our lives on our thumbs, on our mobile phones. And I have tested your uh, WeChat mini program, the Mercedes-Benz mini program on WeChat, and that works very well. I can book a maintenance service for my car right away with a click on my thumbs. So that is also one of your strategies, reaching out to the audience in a way that they prefer. Of course, uh, we are in very close col collaboration, whether it's Alibaba, whether it's Baidu, whether it's Tencent, with the big, huge, very successful tech companies here in China, and uh, try to um, fit ourselves into their ecosystem, but at the same time building our own ecosystem, which is attractive to our customers as well. So it's not about exclusion, it's all open space, and then it's about competition and trying to offer the best service to some extent by 
by combining what's in these ecosystems by some, in some extent, perhaps offering something better because we know about what the car is doing uh, to the customer. And that's uh, where we think the success lies. We just have to um, accept and benefit from the fact that no population in this world is so tech savvy, uh, savvy like, uh, like um, Chinese people are, and that's a tremendous opportunity. Yeah. Now, we only have less than two minutes left. I really want to ask you here, because we have so many young people here. Some of them might be owners of a startup firm. Some of them might be graduates looking for a job, and they, some of them are watching this conference online. Um, what kind of talents are you looking for? Well, um, first of all, people who are curious, who are excited about new things, who really want to be pioneers. Second, um, today, even Nobel Prizes typically are not given to single people anymore, to single person. But it's all about teamwork. Uh, developing cars is teamwork. So we want people who have fun to work in, in groups, in teams, and really want to make big, big steps. And um, on top of that, it would be nice if they have some uh, international background, potentially. Yeah. Um, and Diversity is a very big thing for us, whether it's gender diversity, whether it's age diversity, uh, whether it's cultural diversity. This just makes you a better company. And on that basis, uh, of course, here in China, we have tremendous opportunity uh, to finding these kind of people. And um, we are very happy when you apply and you show up. And we potentially might have the perfect job for you. And we benefit, and hopefully you do too. And final question, what is your fantasy about a perfect smart car? Well, um, I still want to have fun uh, with the car, so it should have an emotional design. Uh, of course, it should be extremely convenient, so when I want to do something else, the car can take care of everything I need, but I still want to have the chance to have just fun by driving the car myself. And when there's a big traffic jam, I push a button and then I fly to the other side of the city and then it goes on. <laughs> and one of the, my fantasy of a perfect smart car would be, everyone knows, the Transformers. They know us, they talk to us, they protect us like a perfect boyfriend you can ever have. Thank you so much, Dido. Let me sum up our session with uh, quoting the great late Stephen Hawking that intelligence is, in the end, the ability to adapt to changes. So as we are concerned about how much machines can learn in the future, maybe we can, should be more concerned about what humans can learn today. Thank you so much, Dieter. Thank Great you, Lily. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.